have a look at this. The bees are bringing in the nectar from right around here, probably up to a three kilometre radius, and they're bringing it back to the hive. They're condensing it down. You can see the nectar glistening right down the cells. And now they're putting their wax capping over the top. It's like a, a lid on a preserving jar to say, hey, that honey's ready. It's going to keep for actually up to 3,000 years, like they have in the Egyptian tombs, which is That's insane. Crazy. And uh, that way, when we see the capping on, we're lucky enough to be able to share some of their honey too. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Today, we have Jos Backer here, very special guest. He's uh, I'm just a bit excited to be here. I can finally <laughs> leave Fed Square because the house is now gone. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. I went down there. You might have seen the video. We'll put it in the links below to check out his work where he's basically designed a future food system for humans to live in. In fact, it doesn't even work without the humans, right? The humans are an integral part of the system which then creates food from our waste. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's mimicking nature, really. So every single element is crucial to make it all work. And if you're not there, then the steam from the shower and the residue from the hot water service means that the mushrooms die. And if you don't create nutrients from the toilet and the organic waste, that means that the worms die and the worms feed the fish and the yabbies and then the nutrients from the fish feed the plant. So it's all reliant wow. on human tenants. That's amazing. I loved watching you pick that massive, uh, was it a lion's mane mushroom? Yeah. That was incredible. Just right out of your, um, what you called your mushroom. <laughs> Every <laughs> Which house is the room. have a bathroom, a bedroom and a mushroom. <laughs> that's right. I love that idea that a living room is actually a space that's just filled with life. Totally. You know, and everywhere with plants, including the bedroom, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to harvest some honey, but we're also going to answer questions. If you've got questions for myself or Yost, then chime in, comments below, and B will read them out, and uh, she'll be keeping an eye out for your questions, so don't be shy. Get in there, put your questions, and we'll get to answering those. But first, let's tap a bit of this honey off, because it's coming in springtime here. It's more important than ever here uh, in New South Wales, Australia, to harvest honey allow them to move some up from the bottom and make way for the queen to lay new eggs. And that'll limit, help limit swarming, which is one thing we need to do in the springtime here to limit the spread of our varroa mite. So without further ado, let's uh, set this up now. All we need to do is get a little tube like this. And if you have a look at the, the view here in the back of the frames, you can see the bees are doing an amazing job of filling up the cells. So you see this pattern, let's start over here, where the cells are almost full, right? But the nectar, they've been collecting, they've been condensing it down, they've been trying to get that moisture content down below the 20% range, and then they put their capping on top, like we can see on these frames here. So we'll choose a frame that we can see it's capped, and even if you look down between the frames, you can see the capping the bees are actually uh, walking on. So we'll choose one of those, put our tube in, our jar underneath. We take out our little cover strip up here, which gives us access to the frame where we can then put what looks like a big Allen key in the top. Now this has just been poking into mud, so get that a little clean. And uh, I'm going to turn this key now. Now sometimes with the wax and the propolis, right, it's so stuck together that it's easier to turn it just bit by bit. And also, if you just wanted to harvest a little bit, you could just turn it like that, and you'd just get one jar. And you could leave the rest for the bees. So it's a nice versatile thing you can do. Wow, I or, thought about that. Or we can just turn the rest of it. And actually, it's quite easy today, so I'll go ahead and harvest a whole lot like that. And so that's one out of the six frames, and we'll see if we can get some nice honey. It's very exciting because we've been low on honey. It's been winter time here. There hasn't been as many flowers as there usually is in winter. and we actually ran out of honey, which is amazing. It <laughs> hasn't... you appreciate it more though when you run out, don't you it, think? Exactly. I mean, it hadn't run out for like something like, uh, I don't know, probably a decade or so. And there we were. No honey. Our kids scraping the, the, the bottom of the jars and what was worse was the Varroa mite thing. That there was a mandate, you're not allowed to harvest honey. So then it was like, wow, we're really out. 
but um, now we're allowed to harvest honey again, which is a good thing to uh, allow space in the brood nest down the bottom. But just to be aware, those of you in New South Wales, you're still not allowed to move a hive. So if you are getting started in beekeeping, you'll need to put your hive where the bees are and keep it there for a while till those restrictions lift and you're allowed to move them back to your place. Any questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. We've got a special guest here, Joost Backer, who's, uh, who's come up to um, see our apiary here. You've got um, some flow hives as part of your future food system, right? Yeah, and we have them at, on our farm in Mombok as well, where we live at our home. And I've always had them kind of up away from the house. So when the one that was at Fed Square, I've actually moved and put right next to my kitchen because I just got so excited by a future food system, just being able to go out and get honey whenever you need it. Oh, look at that. It's a beautiful thing. Oh. I'm actually going to have to taste that. It's so good. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful spring honey. You can the the lighter colours here come in the springtime. They're full of those beautiful Australian uh, aromas. It's like there's so many grevilleas flowering here at the moment, and um, mm. but I've got a whole. The front of my house is like quite steep, and I planted it just for bees. So we planted like heaps of rosemary and other herbs, mm. and it's just there's just like this honey flow at the moment. Beautiful. Yes, we've, oh sorry, we've yeah, got a go question um, yeah. about uh, your future food um, project. Yeah. Uh, Samantha says, how would one set something up like this in the northern climate? I'm in northern BC. Northern? Northern climate, so the northern hemisphere. Um, easy, you just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's obviously more important than to have like a, no a north, what would be south there to utilize almost like a glass house on the front of the building. I mean, I think in the northern climate, it would make sense. A bit like um, the way that those, uh, what are they, what, what's that system that they have where they bury the tires? But it's- The Earthship. Earthship kind of idea, you know. It would just be amazing in Holland where I grew up, like a lot of places have glass houses to the south. And in winter, the sun comes out and that little glass house warms up and you've got the doors over to your home and you get that airflow coming in. It just, that just makes so much sense to me to have that glass house on, on, on the north, on the south, on the north here. Mm. It, you know, the sun is so low in winter, it comes in, it heats up. And that's kind of the way we designed future food system that we had that, that balcony that was facing the kitchen was in the sun the whole day in winter. And then the, the south, you had like a neat, almost like a, a glass house to the, to the north as well. You know, sun is, is key and having winter sun where you're cooking and where your kitchen is, I don't know, like makes when you're preparing food in the middle of winter and you've got the sun coming in, it's just, it's just the best, you know? And so yeah, think about the sun, think about where you can best capture the sun, whether it's, you know, sun in the morning, midday, and oh, you just made that. I just made that. There's a meniscus of honey on top with that beautiful curved shape. In fact, the lid probably won't go on, so this isn't very COVID safe, but it's better sip it down a little bit. So <laughs> We've got another one from Wabi Makwa. Everything is grown in plastic. How do, you, how do microplastics affect the system? Long-term effects? Yeah, so I don't use PVC. So uh, PVC is, is, is uh, not only is it a nightmare, you can't recycle it, and it also leaches. So all the plastic that I use is polypropylene or polyethylene, and that is safe to use. And when you, I use a lot of recycled materials, like recycled 44 gallon drums, you've got to make sure that you use drums when you make a wicking bed or when, when, when you make a plant something that holds a plant that you're going to eat, you've got to make sure that it was used for food. I tend to like vinegar drums, lots of vinegar barrels. You can buy, um, sometimes you get them for jam. So you get these barrels and they just smell like jam or they smell like vinegar. So you've just got to be careful that, you know, the barrels that you use, if you're using virgin material, it's obviously a bit easier. And the reason why I always use black plastic is because it warms the soil up. 
the reason why almost all commercial farmers grow strawberries and garlic and in black plastic is because it radiates heat and it means that you don't have to worry about fungicides because the underside of the crop gets heated up. It has a huge, makes a huge difference with the amount of fungicide you need to use because the plastic radiates heat, mm -hmm. the soil warms up and um, yeah, you can get a much longer season, especially in the northern climates like in places like Holland and uh, North America, Canada. Um, it's really good. So you can extend the season out. You can have tomatoes pretty much um, for 10 months of the year. Wow, interesting. Um, there's not many questions coming through Facebook or YouTube. Okay, so if you've got questions, put it in the comments below. We're uh, still harvesting a bit of honey here, so any questions about beehives, bees, or Yoast Backer's uh, future food system is a special guest we have here at Flow HQ today. If you missed uh, the video we put out when I was down at his future food system in Fed Square in Australia, we'll put the link in below and you can take a look at that. It's a really good show and tell of all sorts of ways that you can actually deal with waste and actually turn it into food. Even styrofoam was being digested by mealworms. And, and An Australian native species actually from far north Queensland. Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah. so there's hope for us yet, you think? <laughs> <laughs> they use it as food and they turn it into, um, yeah, this organic material which, you know, ultimately if they actually eat, the, eat it, like if they run out of food, they even go back through what's left and take out everything. Wow. There's a lot of research going on, especially in the UK, using these mealworms as an alternative um, to clean up our plastic pollution. And what are you left with? Can you grow something in what you're left with? Well, it's, it is a fertilizer. It's like a, a manure, really, a manure alternative. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that's but the thing that was so crazy was that um, we got all of our white goods from Mila and they said, oh, we'll take all the styrofoam off because you've got this zero waste project and we'll take it. And I said, no, no, I want you to deliver the, the stuff in start with the styrofoam on. And so we filled up this incredible stomach with all the styrofoam that came from around the dishwasher and the washing machine and, and, and uh, the fridge. And as soon as it started to warm up in Melbourne, it was like January, February, all the styrofoam was gone. They just devoured it. And which makes sense because they're from the, the species is from far north Queensland, so they they love that hot weather. But what shocked wow. us was at the rate that. So I remember walking around Federation Square looking through rubbish bins trying to find styrofoam to that, feed the mill. I didn't want them to die and run out of food, which is crazy, right? Wow, that is incredible. I'm getting uh, quite a few questions on Yos. Stream wanting to know how the bees aren't getting injured through the process of you harvesting honey. Okay, that's a uh, that's a great question and it's something my dad and I spent a long time. So I invented this system with my father called the Flow Hive, and the way it works is partially formed honeycomb cells, which you can see in here, uh, form the matrix of the comb. The bees build onto that. Now, as you've rightly identified. It could be designed in ways that could harm the bees. In the beginning, we had parts that moved a bit like this. So if, you've got, if my hands are the hexagons and you move your hands like this, then it creates channels down through the comb. So each cell that the bees are putting their honey in is splitting in half. And that was all good and well for the harvesting. But if a bee was down a cell and it moved back, then a bee could put a leg or a wing through that gap there and could get caught. So what we did, and we've got a whole nother patent around this, is we put a gap, a V-shaped gap here. So the bees bridge that with their own wax. When the parts move like this and back, there's a gap left so the bees can't catch their legs or wings in the cells. So that was a really important Thing. It's, it's actually genius. We put a lot of the effort into of genius, that is. <laughs> a lot no, of because, effort. Because I mean, bee, traditionally, when you harvest honey, you lose a lot of bees. A lot of bees die uh, true. in the process of. That's what makes this such a, a compelling idea. We've got some bee questions on YouTube. We have um, Jack and Whale. How long can you leave a flow hive alone when you go on holiday? Is it okay to leave the hive for five months and then come back and would they be fine? So that's a great question. Unlike chickens that need to be put home each night and a lot of pets, uh, 
bees actually you can go away for months at a time. Now it does depend on what time of year. If you were going away in the springtime and you didn't get to harvest the honey, that would be a bit of a shame. There's also things you want to do. So at certain times of year, you might want to get somebody to go and check on your hive and make sure everything's okay. And you're looking for whether the bees are building up too much or whether there's not enough bees. So when you identify that there might be an issue, then you intervene and that's your job as a beekeeper. So while you can go away m months at a time, there's certain times of year where you want to be around to make sure if the bees are going to swarm, you get ahead of the curve and you might take a split and divide your colony in two. And rather than half your hive going and making a, uh, a, a new home in your um, neighbour's mailbox or whatever could cause a bit of disruption if you're in suburbia, you then get to keep your other hive. But they are a wonderful uh, thing to keep because yes, you can go away for months at a time. Hey, I had someone that came to Future Food System for dinner and had a flow hive in Northcote and he claimed that he harvested 34 kilos of honey from one hive in one year. Is it pulling my leg? No, no, like uh, we get these That's situations crazy. when you get on a good honey flow where you harvest all the frames and then a week or two later they're all full again and you harvest them again. You get 18 kilograms if you harvest that box there and this is our smaller sized hive. So, wow. so you can harvest an enormous amount of honey. In fact beekeepers do boast sometimes they get like a 44 gallon, so 200 litre drum of honey from a single hive in a single season. So Apis mellifera, wow. the European honeybee, makes an extraordinary amount of honey absolutely ridiculous there's no other species on the planet that can do that not only that a hive of that size can pollinate 50 million flowers in a day and that's become an integral part of our food chain also we've got a question from brad who's a regular he says hello i've always wondered is there a reason why i never see any of your hives larger than a single deep box with a single super ah yes it's me and how I want to manage my hives. If you want to add more boxes, you can add more boxes to your hive. You can add another honey super, you can add another brood box. I like to keep it simple. It's much easier to find the queen if you've only got one brood box to, to look through if, you, if you're needing to find her. And also you've just got one box to take off if you want to do your brood inspections. Now this morning I was harvesting honey um, for, for another show and tell and it was from a double super box at my place. So it's not, they're not all like that, but yes, looking around, there is none with double supers here. We might put some on as the, the spring honey flow kicks in for some of the hives that want a bit um, more room. But what I prefer to do is if the bees are really building up and you look in the windows and you can hardly see the comb anymore, this is actually getting Getting, getting there, you can still see the comb through there, but if you can't, then there's enough bees in there that you can take a split. And that's my preferred method of, um, of making more room, is you just move half the bees into another box. If you don't want another colony, somebody else really will. So it's a nice thing to do, to take splits from your hives. One of my friends, uh, he's moved now, but he was in uh, the Patch, which is this little crater, volcano crater in the Dandenong Ranges. And he'd worked out that there were over 250 people that had a hive because of his initial hive. Like, he'd given away that. Really? Many. Yeah, yeah. That's a good effort. Yeah. And my sister um, moved That's where to... I started, actually, with one of his as well. So he gave them to me, and then I ultimately, at one stage, I had 16, and then I started giving them away as well. And so... That's amazing. Yeah, my sister's been breeding them madly at my place. She's living there and she's got, uh, she started off with two and now she's got more than 40 in a couple of, uh, couple of years. So she's been busy splitting them as they need to be split. So if you, if, you get it, if you get into the rhythm of it and you want to build up your bees, you can do it quite quickly. Or you can just let them be and just split the ones in need and do a much slower growth curve to your apiary. Yeah. We've got a question from Simon. He says, hi, my family and friends love my honey from my flow hive and think I should never enter some, I should enter some in the Royal Adelaide show for judging. Are there any particular things judges will look for? I have several different flavored jars from last season. What flavors should judges look for? Ah, there's a lot um, in it. 
and it's a good idea to, to look. And Flow Hive does win honey competitions often. Clarity is one of the things they look for and because you're not spinning the honey in a centrifuge and mixing it with all sorts of wax parts and you generally don't have to go through any kind of filtering process to get to a really nice, clear product. So that's one of the things they look for. Another one is specifically they want the jar filled to the perfect amount but you know that's just one of these honey competition things so you've got to get that right as well. And they usually have uh, competitions for dark honeys and light honeys so you might want to choose one of each to enter. My uncle just won a competition in Victoria uh, with his flow hive honey and he just chose the jar of honey he harvested a year ago because he particularly liked that flavour and so did the judges. So use your own, um, your own discretion as to what is the most beautiful thing you've found and enter that because you'll find other people will think so too. Another question from Angela. She says, do you think it's a good idea to save honey throughout the season to give the bees the best chance of surviving a cold winter? I feel like there would be good medicine in that honey. So it depends where you are in the world. Here we always have something flowering. You don't need to feed the bees. We don't need to save honey for the bees. But lots of places in the world do where you get a long cold winter, perhaps they're digging hives out of snow when the spring time comes. And for those places, they might need five, six, or even seven months of, uh, of honey that they can have access to. So in those places, you might need to leave a whole box of honey for your hive to survive the winter, or even two boxes of honey. So it just really depends. Ask your local beekeepers, get some advice on how much honey you might need to leave for your bees to survive the winter. If you have a winter, we don't really have one here. No. How many bees can you comfortably have in one of those single boxes? So we could probably fit something like 40,000 bees in this hive here, which is an incredible number. Bees uh, surprise you with numbers all the time. As I was saying earlier, a hive like this could pollinate 50 million flowers in a day, and that's just absolutely ridiculous. And if you add up the actual flight, like a relay, several times around the world in one day, so you get that from a little insect that big which has you know tiny wings that beat at 250 cycles a second can fly up to 40 kilometers an hour and the funny thing is when you've got like your iphone and you do slow motion which i love to do at the edge of the hive they look so uncoordinated they bump into each other and you go how can you guys be so smart at doing you know because isn't it true that they also work out the best like the most uh, um the shortest way to approach, like they kind of work out, okay, that's where we're going, and then they, they seem to be able to make the best. They call that the bee line, right? Walk the bee line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they they tend to, like if you look at them, they're not really going in a straight line, right? But if you track them, then it actually is pretty straight, even though they're wandering minutely as they go. So they're on a mission to get the flowers, to get the pollen, get the nectar, bring it back to the hive. And, uh, so that can um, be a fairly straight line um, out and back to the hives, which is where that, where that term comes from. And uh, one thing that happened to us at uh, Fed Square is there were pest control putting a chemical in to try and get rid of, I think it was an ant or something on one of the car parks nearby, okay. which we didn't know about. Yep. And I was um, walking towards the house, away from the house, and I just thought, what are these massive flies flying around me? And what it was was bees carrying dead bees. Ah. So they were pulling dead bees out of the hive and then dropping them sort of 20, 30 metres away from the hive. Yeah. And I was just in shock. And I thought that I'd lost the hive. And then I called, you know, my friend who has got many yes. bees. And he said, don't worry, they'll know not to go back there. It's just about communicating to everyone else, stop going there, and they'll recover. He, he was so confident that they would recover. And for two or three days, it looked like there was nothing going on in the hive. Yeah. And then within a week, mm. it, it was just on steroids again. 
you know, and it just made me realize how resilient they actually are. Like they can quickly work out, okay, that's mm. that's dangerous. We can't go there. Yeah. But in an urban environment, it's really, you know, it's really important to know that that can happen because you're surrounded by, you know, within five kilometers, you could potentially be surrounded by a million people. Yes. Um, in a place like South Melbourne or Albert Park or in Sydney and Surrey Hills, if you've got a hive, you know, there's lots of people doing lots of stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it can happen here too. Your neighbour could be spraying for something or... Yeah, so it happens in the urban areas as well. It's very sad when you see a pesticide kill. And it, I've had it even at my place, which is pretty remote here, where somehow um, two of my hives out of, say, 40 have, have um, somehow found flowers that have been sprayed and have come back and what you get is a carpet of dead bees out the front all with their tongues hanging out. That's exactly what we had. And that's a telltale sign that um, you've had a uh, poisoning issue. And yeah, like you said, bees are resilient and they bounce back, but it's a sad thing. Sometimes they don't. Um, and it's just a piece of awareness that humans need to change their ways. A billion litres of insecticide is sprayed onto our earth every year. And we need to get from where we are now, which is with a food system which is so um, polluting and uses so much land to a food system that is integrated in a way that has balance, that creates habitat, which, you know, even in an urban environment like, like you do, where um, you can produce food in, in ways that don't require a chemical use like that. Well, it's interesting, like I was on a radio show about 10 years ago and there was uh, some urban beekeepers were on the radio show before me and they had done a pollen count on hives that they had in Rutherglen Glen on a farm and they the bees had visited 17 different species for the for the honey right, right. and they had hives on a rooftop in Burke Street on one of the office towers and there were over 380 species that those bees had so the, you know it shocked yeah, them wow. that the urban bees had a much greater diversity of plants but of course it makes sense right if you're in the suburbs and you look down especially if you're in a plane you can just see all these tiny little gardens mm. and you know you might have a dutch background and have tulips in your garden or you might have vietnamese <laughs> background and have vietnamese mint or whatever growing you know yes and so i actually think that our urban areas they already are incredibly diverse but if we actually then think about nature and about you know everything that goes it can be so much more. It's amazing actually, urban beekeepers boast that they get a longer foraging season for their bees and more variety of floral sources. And um, that's amazing. People are planting all sorts of things and it's great to plant things because you know they become habitat, they become a really important piece of the puzzle. So it's a good thing that urban areas can support bees, not only our European honeybee, but the 20,000 native bee species in the world that all need homes and some of them only range for like 200 meters so you planting forage in your yard actually helps some of the species that are on the brink of extinction yep. make a stepping stone a bit further and if you're lucky you might be helping that species connect back to a corridor to a wild space and help save it yeah, uh, in Melbourne, they just got a, enough, they had a Kickstarter campaign, not as su su successful as yours, but successful enough to raise enough money to build one of the world's biggest urban uh, what, uh, corridors, you know, for bees, birds. I think it, it's 20,000 uh, square metres all up. Yes. In, a, in the middle of suburbia, so. So good, isn't it? It's we, happening all over the world. We donated some seed funding to get them going from our beekeeping course, and uh, we'll put a link below because it's such a cool program and yeah. and just great to see this kind of stuff happening all over the world where people are taking on initiatives to bring life into our spaces because without life you know yeah we're in trouble yeah so so good so that was from the beekeeper.org which is our online course people from all over the world are donating to that um sorry uh, contributing to that says so experts from all over the world and then new beekeepers are learning from that and it's also a fundraiser to put funds towards habitat Fantastic. and great initiatives so it's been a been a great thing to educate and raise funds if you're in the US non-toxic neighborhoods is another really good one to get behind um, yeah I mean you 
pretty much find most cities will have a group that is trying to, you know, reduce the pesticide use that's happening. Insecticide, herbicide. We don't need to use this stuff. Any more questions coming in? We've got a great one for you. How do bees fit into the future food system and have you noticed any improvement in your produce? Um, well, we in Melbourne you can't really grow sugarcane, although somebody came on a tour and gave me a cutting of sugarcane and said um, he lived in Richmond. And so uh, I couldn't believe that in Richmond. He said, I've been growing sugarcane in Richmond for 30 years, so you'll be able to grow it here. And it did grow really well. But our only really source of, of sweetness was, were tiger nuts and honey. And so for us, it was really important to have honey. But then again, it was also really important from a pollination point of view. Um, yeah, I've been growing food my whole life pretty much with, with my dad growing up and then, you know, always growing food myself. I have to say that I was completely shocked at Fed Square at how productive everything was, how the yield that we got off everything. It was like a little microclimate there. Mm. And we were protected from harsh winds. And as soon as the sun came up, everything warmed up. And so it just created this perfect environment for bees to hang around and pollinate things. And you know, a huge amount of apples on each, uh, on each one as well. So um, we had like dwarf apples that where every single flower was pollinated. And, and um, you know, you had to actually thin the apples Incredible, because there's places in the world which don't actually have an environment where pollinators can live anymore, and that's so toxic there, right? So there's people climbing up the apple trees with pollen and feathers, self-pollinating. Isn't that bizarre, right? But uh, that is the extreme end of where we're really in trouble. Like how many people can climb trees and do our pollination for us? Yeah, it's well, I mean, if, if this hive alone pollinates 50 million flowers I mean how many humans would you need and we're gonna be busy pollinating yeah, if, we, yeah. if we don't look after our world but I've got this theory that we need to be in this situation in order to you know people need to feel it and see it and know that we're in trouble in order to act and I think that what's going on in China especially with um, the move away from chemical use and uh, the pollution issues that they have and it's just it's really inspiring to see like they you're not allowed to burn straw in china anymore they right. banned that well that's a hundred million farmers that were burning straw right. every year and now they're making soil and now they're making soil and and um, some of the crops that they're turning into cardboard and paper so instead of using wood chips that were imported they're now using this byproduct yeah um, mainly because they just wanted to stop that pollution and you know and then there's lots of other countries as well that are saying right we're going to be organic within two or three or four five years yes. working towards that finding alternative solutions for fertilizer it's yeah it's brilliant sweden is uh, determined to be completely self-sufficient in npk fertilizer and it's all from human urine wow so they've got this toilet system which is a two-bowl toilet system and the houses have tanks and once a year the urine gets collect collected from the tank gets dehydrated and turned into so, but, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it, that it, it, in many places, like in Australia, a lot of that fertilizer from human waste just goes out to sea. Yeah. You're like, well, that's kind of the wrong spot for it. You know, can't we uh, reuse that like it's meant to be in the, in the food cycle? Well, that's, for me, the big thing. That's why I think if we don't, as a society, embrace zero waste, we're doomed. Mm. And for we, we're not we're living so far from that natural system. Yes. So we're all undernourished. Everyone talks about the fact that we're undernourished. You know the you know that the Hudsa have something like 17 times more zinc in their diet, 15 times more more um, calcium in their diet, and their fiber is like if not 20 times more than what we take. So we know that our diet needs to change, but that diet can't change unless we put our nutrients back into our food system. You can't expect carrots to give you zinc if there's no zinc in the soil you can't expect mm. you know cal so we need to think about closing that cycle and getting our nutrients back into where it comes from absolutely so zero waste is inevitable if we don't embrace it we're doomed the very de definition of sustainability is something that we can go on doing forever yeah and you know if we can't go on doing it forever then we're not sustainable so it's obvious what we need to do 
in order to sustain ourselves. Yeah. And restore. We've got a lot of repair. Oh, I'm a big believer in restoration and repair. Yeah. Time for a last question. We've got a flow frame one from Annette. She asks, some of our flow super frames have mold whilst, whilst stored over winter. Do the frames need to go in the freezer or will the bees clean them? Okay, the very best way to store frames is particularly if you're in a humid climate and you actually want to take this box off for the winter. Now in colder climates, that's often the case. People want to downsize their hive a bit, pack it down for the winter, which gives the bees a little bit more of a chance to uh, keep their hive warm. So in that case, yes, as you say, the very best way to store them is in the freezer. You can put them back on in the springtime and they're pretty much as they were. If you've left them in a more humid environment and they've gotten a bit mouldy, it's not the end of the world. There's, um, you can either let the bees clean them up after giving them a bit of a wash and a dry, or if you really want to do a better job than that, a hot water pressure washer is the way to really strip that, um, the wax off and uh, it's surprisingly hard to get off, so you need a bit of, bit of power and a bit of gumption there. Thank you very much for all of your great questions, and a special thanks to Yost Backer and, and uh, for answering all the questions about his future food system. I'm pretty excited to be here. And warmer than Melbourne at the moment, that's for sure. <laughs> and tune in, same time next week, we will be doing some hive splitting next week. So if you want to see a live hive split where we take half of the bees out of here and put it in, a, another box and we'll show you exactly how to do that important thing to do here in New South Wales limit bees from swarming will limit the spread of the varroa mite that we're trying to contain so tune in next week same time thank you thank and you. you can take some honey home oh yes and it's warm <laughs> <laughs>